Dear Lord Jesus, please let us hear your words in our hearts, in our minds, and our souls. In your name, amen. Please be seated. Today is a book of transfiguration. It's titled Face to Face with God. The disciples of Jesus had a terrifying experience with God. At least three of them did. It was the inner circle consisting of Peter, James, and John. There with Jesus on a high mountain. Mark tells us simply that while they were in his presence, Jesus was transfigured before them. His garments became glistening, intensely white. And there appeared to them Elijah with Moses talking to Jesus. And Peter said to Jesus, Master, it is well that we are here. Let us make three dwellings, one for you and one for Moses and one for Elijah. Mark tells us Peter said this because he did not know what to say. For they were exceedingly afraid. Have you ever been so afraid that all you could do is babble? People react in different ways to fear. Some become quite talkative, others morosely silent. Fear brings out the best in some people, and others crack under the strain. As this is Super Bowl Sunday, I can't do this without bringing up a football quote. The legendary Lou Brockney knew the power of fear. Today we call it psyching out your opponent. Notre Dame faced a critical football game against a vastly superior Southern California team. Brockney recruited every brawny student he could find at Notre Dame and suited up about a hundred hulks in the school uniform. On the day, day of the game, the Southern California team ran out on the field first and awaited the visiting Fighting Irish. Then out of the dressing room came an army of green giants who kept on coming and coming and coming. And the, and the USC team panicked. Their coach reminded them that Rodney could only play 11 men simultaneously. But the damage was already done. USC lost. They did not lose to the 100 men. They were beaten by their own fear. This was not the only time the disciples were fearful in Jesus' presence. There were many such occasions. In this same chapter, Jesus tries to tell his disciples that he must be crucified. But after three days, he will rise. Mark tells us that he did not understand what he was talking about, but they were afraid to ask him. Gentle Jesus, meek and mild. How could anybody ever be afraid of Jesus? We have so sentimentalized this man from Nazareth that we can't even imagine grown men being afraid in his presence. But they were. And why not? If he is who he says he is, who can help to be fearful in his presence? Here was absolute purity, absolute love. Have you, ever, have you ever been in the presence of someone so perfect they made you feel uncomfortable? We talked last week about Jesus of authority. Have you ever been around anyone who spoke with authority? Another football record story. Vince Lombardi, legendary coach of the Green Bay Packers, spoke with authority. Even his toughest linemen were no match against Lombardi. When he says, sit down, said one player, I didn't even bother looking for a chair. I wonder if Jesus used that same leadership style as Vince Lombardi. 
only a couple of times, according to the gospel, did he vent his anger. Still, Jesus could not have been the passive, not threatening, non-threatening, Casper milk toast sort of fellow some have made him out to be. He was absolutely pure. That was the significance of the glistening white garments. Absolute purity, absolute love. These were the sources of his authority. The transfiguration experience helped us focus on Jesus' uniqueness, power, purity, and love. One of the men whose stock had risen in popular minds over the, over the last 50 decades, 10, five decades, sorry, 50 years, former President Dwight David Eisenhower. W. A. Howard Chase handled the public relations part of Eisenhower's first presidential campaign. He tells about an incident that he believes was a turning point in that campaign. Eisenhower was scheduled to stop in Colorado before the Republican convention. One of his supporters, a member of the Meat Cutters Union and a veteran of the 101st Airborne Invasion of Normandy Beach, came up with an idea. How about an arrival lunch for 2,000 or more Ike supporters on the Friday before the convention? And how about if he and his union buddies assembly, assembled 50 paraplegic victims of the attack on Normandy in wheelchairs and on cots, and another 250 walking wounded front and center of the podium where Ike would stand? It was a good idea, and it was put into action. Using a mobilized cheering section of 5,000, Ike was met upon his arrival from Colorado at Union Station and escorted to the Hotel Baldwin. He was unaware of the conspiracy of veterans and Union support, but awaited him. At the head table, there stood eight thick black candles, each three feet tall. From the upper balcony came the sound of taps, accompanied by a poignant roll of drums. A ghostly silence swept the hall as paraplegic veterans of the 101st approached each candle, extinguished it, and a voice from nowhere intoned. Corps of Engineers, 101 killed, 395 wounded. Communications, 80 wounded, 425 wounded, and so on down each of the eight components of the division. Eisenhower stood like an ivory statue, bloodless fingers gripping the lectern as the eerie ceremony continued. But the final drum roll ended and taps wound down. No one spoke or moved for a full minute. No one introduced Dyke. Finally, he broke the silence and spoke to the wounded. With the help of God, he said, this will not happen again. He said no more. The tension broke from silence as in death. The ballroom became a chamber of pandemonium. Press, radio, TV people were not only Their cheers and tears mingled with those of the Eisenhower supporters. W. Howard Chase turned to his wife with two words. He's in. Political chemistry, yeah, but would not have worked if I had not been the kind of man he was. Of course, Eisenhower was not in Jesus' league. That's all right. No one else has been either. The experience on the Mount of Transfiguration will not allow us to make a timid, tentative, tepid information about this man, Jesus. Either he is who he says he is, or he is not. All heaven and earth depend on our answer. The verses that follow Peter's mindless babbling are insightful and a 
and a cloud overshadowed them, and a voice came out of the cloud. This is my beloved son. Listen to him. And suddenly, looking around, they no longer saw anyone with him but Jesus only. The focus of the story ends where it must end, on Jesus. Mark tells us that the disciples no longer saw anyone with them but Jesus only. There is more to those words than we might suppose. All other concerned were eclipsed by the glory of what they had seen on that mountaintop. Quietly, they would go back down the mountain, pondering the significance of it all in their hearts. It was too grand for them to get their minds around. Even after the resurrection, they would still be questioning, searching for understanding. However, they would be forever moved by what happened on that mountain. Their fear had been transformed into faith. If the <clears throat> focus of that place was Christ and Christ alone, if for any reason you are still in doubt, may I introduce you to the transfigured and resurrected Christ. Please close your eyes now. Imagine that you are on that mountaintop. You are witnessing the transfiguration through the eyes of Peter, James, and John. And as the clouds start to dissipate, you see this figure emerge. The light is dazzling, bright, so pure, so intense that you almost have to shield your eyes. Hold this image in your mind if you can. And it gets brighter and brighter. You can feel the rays reflecting on you, on your body, on your mind, and on your soul. You are being washed in the radiance of Jesus Christ. You feel the warmth of Jesus' love filling you up. If you can hold that image, you are reliving the transfiguration. Do this when you sit down to pray and image that scene, scene and start your prayers and you will be face to face with God.